Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and we're going to be discussing brand and product decisions in global marketing. That is chapter 10. We are, I guess you can say, a little more than halfway through the book. There are 17 chapters. Uh, we will do some uh, judicious skipping uh, in the last month and change that we have left. But this is a very, very important chapter. When you talk about brands, you're talking about a product, certainly enough, but you're also talking about characteristics. You're talking about brand awareness. You're talking about brand consciousness, brand equity, brand um, durability as well. Uh, one of the things that um, we find in a society like this is that we have a lot of choices and there are lots of brands out there competing for our attention and there's a lot of different ways in which th that attention can be can be gained or won and it but it's becoming a lot more difficult because there's so many impressions that we are hit with on a daily basis. And if I can show you this graphic here, this graphic is kind of a, I guess you can say an illustration of how brands are related. You have the parent companies that you see on the inner part of this diagram with Kraft, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, Mars, Kellogg's, General Mills, PepsiCo, and Coca-Cola. And if you look at the branches leading to the parent company, you have all of these family brands. So you look at Kraft. Kraft has in its portfolio Cadbury, Kool-Aid, Triscuit, Premium Crackers, Ritz, Oreo, and these are uh, Nabisco brands. But it also has others like Oscar Mayer, uh, Shake and Bake, some others, A&W, Welch's, Snapple. These are all craft companies. And then you look at Nestle, you look at P&G, we, we will have Omar Goff coming here. Uh, to speak to us about PNG, and these are some of the consumer products that PNG puts out as its brands. And then Johnson and Johnson, some of these are very familiar brands. Unilever, uh, that is a, I believe that is a British company. That is a British uh, consumer goods company. You have Mars, Kellogg's, General Mills, PepsiCo which has the very famous uh, franchises of KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. So this represents a very interesting uh, idea of that, that brands, while there are so many choices, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between brands and sometimes it's uh, difficult uh, to make up your mind which brand is better than the other brand. So then it becomes important to the marketer to determine what are, what are the stimuli that can result in a consumer uh, looking at one brand and preferring it over the other. There are some other articles that I'll just uh, show you here. This article, this is out of Stanford Graduate School of Business, Do Brands Still Matter for Online Shoppers? I remember reading a book some time ago. This was during my graduate studies. It was called The Psychology of the Internet and it had all this information about the internet and you had all these alter egos. You had uh, all of this uh, idea of behavioral patterns as far as uh, how people interacted on the internet. And I would say that for many of us, when we're shopping online, 
we tend to look at brands, but we also look at other information, most notably consumer reviews. So these are becoming a game changer when you start talking about brands. There are all of these ancillary issues that will impact how we look at brands. There, there was a, a debate in the early 90s, do brands still matter in the digital world? This is a this was actually a um, not an not an interview so much because there were several people on this panel and they were all giving their impressions about branding. Does brands still does brand still matter or do brands still matter? And they're giving various views on that topic and they're talking about the role of strategy has it diminished? You know, this idea of branding. Um, on the contrary, I think branding issues are becoming a lot more refined. And I say that because now we have these micro segments where companies are trying to segment by individual because we all have different tastes. We all have different preferences. And we all like to be catered to. And so that it becomes a lot more um, urgent for companies to figure out these different um, patterns in terms of what it is consumers are looking for as uh, individuals. So before I make way to uh, the chapter, chapter 10, I would like to... I would like to look at the schedule very quickly. I sent this message on yesterday. As you can see the date, March the 15th. And so this week we're covering global branding. And then next week, as you can see, we have our third journal, which is a week from today. And that will be on global branding. Then we have our third exam, chapters 8 through 10. And then we'll, we will move on from there. There is a change. Because of the situation, I've made some assessments. And in faculty meetings, we often talk about a variety of issues as it pertains to this platform and this situation that we're in. And I had made mention that perhaps many of us are, are suffering from Zoom fatigue. And because of that, it may not be productive for me to offer yet another assignment after the reverse globalization. So what I'm doing is I'm going to make this reverse globalization project the semester project, and we will present that at the end. That will give you more time. Um, you will not have an individual project to do, but I will have a couple of assignments that are related to your uh, final project. And th these are more like updates. So you'll, you'll provide me updates leading to the final project, but we still will have quizzes. We have two more exams, and I think that will give us enough material for your edification. And I'm looking to have at least um, Omar Goff coming from Procter & Gamble and maybe another guest speaker. I'm not certain at this time. Uh, so that's what we'll do. Make sure that you're following these announcements. I can't express this enough. You'll be surprised at how many students will email me and ask me a question based on something that I've already presented or that I've already posted in the announcements it was in the video, but the reason they didn't see it in the video, even though they were in class, is because they logged on and they stepped away. We have to have some sense of accountability. And I'm not necessarily saying this class, but I think it's, it's a, a general issue where a lot of students are fatigued, frankly, of this platform, and they want more... Uh, human stimulation, and that's natural because it, it also pertains to faculty as well. Uh, we don't 
we do not prefer this platform. And so let's get through this last week and a half, finish strong, and then hopefully by the fall, uh, we will be in a position where we're ac actually back on campus uh, and, and then we can have the benefit of human interaction. So what I will do now is say a few things about brand management. Brand management is the idea that you have uh, a, a practice where you're looking at not just a product, but you're looking at its characteristics, you're looking at the branding, and the brand manager studies that product, looks at the way it's packaged, looked at, looks at how it is promoted, looks at the pricing, looks at the distribution, looks at the touch points, the shelving, everything that has to do with that brand. The, the product, the brand, now you also have product managers and you have brand managers, those are two different positions. But with respect to a brand, you're trying to make sure that the characteristics of that brand are clear. There are brand personalities. Products have personalities that consumers identify with. And it is up to the brand manager to make sure that that message about that brand is very clear and that uh, they're able to position it to those um, to which uh, it, is, it is targeted. So in chapter 10, I will go through the slides and on Thursday, uh, I will say a few more things about branding and perhaps uh, we might see a, a video to drive home the point and then we will move on uh, next week we will have our um, journal our third journal on the 23rd and then on the 25th we will have our third exam and so that's where we're headed again make sure you remain focused and vigilant let's close out the semester on a high note and um, let's just get it done uh, and, and let's, um, uh, let's break for the year with a very uh, relieved uh, feeling and hopefully this will be a, an era that we can uh, look back on and say, okay, we made it through and um, we're better for it. Okay, so I'm going to present this material. This was pre-recorded from a previous semester. so. The information is roughly the same, but I have some very good examples, and I think um, you will find them very instructive. Okay, I will see you on Thursday, and again, be safe, and um, by all means, uh, make sure that if you have questions, you send me an email or you post a question at Canvas. Okay, I'll see you Thursday. Take care. So we look at a brand as giving us an idea of the uh, quality of what we're buying. So for example, I have a bottle of uh, Fiji water. And if we know anything about Fiji, it's in the Pacific Islands. And there's you, you, you see these uh, tourist, tourism videos of Fiji and it's beautiful and you have these waterfalls and you have this pure water and this goes in with the idea of Fiji water. It had a hibiscus flower here which is very pretty and it is um, a very well-known product. In fact, uh, I remember in one news um, there was some kind of a, a press conference when uh, President Trump was drinking Fiji water and they made a big deal out of it because he wasn't drinking an, an American made product. Um, they made an issue out of it. But this certainly is a, a product that has been equated with a better quality of, of, of water. You look at other types of bottled water and I have uh, one here. This bottled water prides itself on uh, purity through its um, being alkalized. 
or having better alkalinity, which meaning the higher alkaline level, the better it is in terms of its purity. So this has a pH of eight. So you have information on the label and the label is in the back of the bottle, which is unique. And then you have educational information also on the back. So it says this is brand is real water, not fake water, which is what would be the opposite of real. But it says uh, taste and feel this difference. And it talks about the process. There's all kinds of information here about how this water was produced, where it was produced, and it offers a value proposition of why this water may be better than others. So here you have all of these different ideas of branding. And as we go through, we see that a product is a good, a service, or idea. And they can be both tangible and intangible. What do we mean by that? Well, we know a, what a good is. A good is something that we buy and we use, we expend we expend the use of it, we get the utility out of it, and then, then, it, then it's gone. And we know that's physical. So I have this bag of Oreo cookies that I think I bought these in South Africa. I'm, I've never opened them, obviously. And I'm, I'm generally fascinated by, uh, I, I buy products from different places and just to see how they uh, differ. But this particular product was manufactured in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for Mondelez, South Africa. And so this was an this is an American product that was manufactured in Saudi Arabia for South Africa, which is a very intangible product. So what, what about services? How is a product a service? Well, if you look at FAMU, FAMU is an institution of higher education. So what do we offer? What are our products? So you may say, well, we offer degrees. And that's true. It is a tangible product that we offer. But we don't really sell degrees. We don't really sell degrees. We are providing service that adds value. So we offer a value proposition that when you leave here and you get that degree, then you have an increase in intellectual capital that you can turn into something tangible in the form of employment or you know, some kind of positioning in the, in the market as an entrepreneur or as someone who's able to command a, a value in the market. So while FAMU does not sell products per se, we don't sell degrees, we offer a service. And that service we offer to those who matriculate through this university. Uh, obviously, the end, the end product is the degree, but the service that we render uh, is the uh, education in the terms of the bachelor's degree or the master's or the doctorate that, that we offer here. So we have tangible, intangible. We have various product types. And the book gives more detail on the product types. And so you can, you can check with uh, the book. They give consumer and industrial goods here. Um, there are other types of goods as well, other categories such as durable goods, non-durable goods. They give you disposable goods. So there are all these various categories of products. This diagram is not in the book, by the way, but this is from Principles of Marketing and it shows the layers of the product. It shows you the core product or the basic purpose, benefits of the product, the value proposition. You have the actual product, which is the the second layer, which gives you the attributes and the characteristics of the product. Then you have the augmented product, which is the extra um, 
attributes that may encourage you to choose one product or the, over the other, such as warranty, such as the uh, payment plan, maintenance, um, delivery, uh, product use instructions. Uh, when, you, when you start talking about buying a car, then you get a, a warranty on the parts, you get a warranty in terms of the number of miles. So those are things that are very important. And also the payment plan of, in terms of the, the uh, interest rate that, that one is offered to pay for a vehicle like a car. Packaging. Packaging is a very, very interesting idea. And I often go through stores and I look at the, um, I go through the aisles and I look at products. Even though I'm not shopping in that aisle, I look at products. I'll look at uh, how they're situated uh, on the shelves. I'll look at the different packaging. Uh, for example, uh, there's a product that has, um, that's named after me. My first name, Daim. And but it has it doesn't have two A's. My name has two A's, uh, but it, it means the same thing. And I bought these products in different places. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the actual packaging. But and I don't remember where I bought this product. But as you can see, this is um, a foil wrapper. And you can see the length, the length of it is 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 long. This is a long candy bar. And it has a kind of a, a mint colored uh, foil or packaging, which goes along with uh, the flavor, I would imagine. Now, you look at this product here. This is the same product, different packaging in a box. But it had these small um, bite-sized pieces of candy. You know, in this box. Uh, I don't remember where I got this from either. Uh, it, it was, I think I got this over in Europe. This one I think I got in Africa. This one I got in Europe. And this one, this different packaging I got in the Caribbean when I was there. I think I got this in St. Martin. And this is cellophane. And it has the little pieces. And all of these are different types, different sizes, different you know, packaging, cellophane, foil in the box. So you have all these different types of uh, the same product. This is basically a toffee, uh, caramel toffee um, product, which is uh, very popular over overseas. Furthermore, I wanted to also share with you this article that I that was submitted as part of a journal article many years ago in a, in a class that is cultural tastes affect international packaging. So this is saying that depending on where you go will affect how products are packaged. You know, which makes a lot of sense. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that they're talking about in here, I'll just read to you. It says cultural differences greatly affect how food product packaging is perceived and how products are sold in various countries. Although we are often advised to avoid judging a book by its cover, marketers know that consumers always judge products in part by their packaging and presentation. The material, size, imagery, color, and quality of a product's container can significantly influence how a product is perceived in other countries and cultures. They give an example here, a very interesting um, example. Uh, they give the example that in the United States, we would probably find it strange to see mayonnaise sold in a large two liter bag with a spout on the top. Imagine that because we're used to finding mayonnaise sold in jars, right? There's, you know, a lot of... Um, famous old school jokes about mayonnaise jars and what you use them for after you're done with the, uh, you know, with the mayonnaise. But um, yeah, this is, um, would be a very different way of packaging mayonnaise in the United States in a two liter bag. This type of mayonnaise container is much more common in Chile, where the average person consumes several pounds of mayonnaise every year. So in Japan, the KFC, since we have 
done a case on KFC. It says... Kentucky Fried Chicken Japan had to fight to break from many of the KFC's standard American practices. Okawara, who is a former president of KFC in Japan, adapted to the local culture that expects higher standards of quality and presentation from fried foods. It was reported that instead of dumping chicken into buckets, KFC in Japan neatly arranges chicken in a single layer in wide boxes with rib plastic bottoms to minimize grease absorption. The simple packaging change had a huge positive impact on customer perception and sales. So yet another example of how packaging makes a big difference when you're talking about international markets. Not to mention the eco packaging, which uh, we even see in this country. Years ago, McDonald's had decided that they were going to move away from the styrofoam uh, actually had a uh, an article that I wanted to share. So this particular article here was um, in back in January. It talked about how McDonald's was going to do away with the styrofoam cups for their drinks. Back in 1990, they used to sell their burgers in these styrofoam packaging called clamshells and they eventually did away with those clamshells because it takes about a hundred years for those styrofoam uh, for styrofoam material to break down so they stopped using styrofoam they went to paper and now they're phasing out the uh, actual styrofoam cups so this idea of labeling. Now again, labeling is extremely important. Uh, when you talk about, uh, I showed you the bottle of water and all of the different um, information that's on the labeling, um, not to mention uh, warning labels, instructions of how to use it. One of the one of the issues with with labeling is that it, it has to be understood in the context of that environment. Uh, even some of the labeling that you find in America may be difficult to follow. If you're talking about portion sizes or serving sizes, when a serving size may be, for example, a package of cookies might be two cookies. Now, most of us, you know, if you're if you're like most people, you would eat more than two cookies, and that nutritional information is based on two cookies. So if it's uh, or if you're drinking a fruit drink and if it's 29 grams of sugar and the serving size is eight ounces, but the drink is 16 ounces, then, you know, you have to double everything because, OK, you have to just do some very simple math. But a lot of times this is uh, this is missed. Um, there was a very tragic case dealing with Nestle's. And as you know, Nestle's is a, it's a Swiss company, and it's a very famous case involving milk formula in Africa, where the mothers using milk formula, and it was being promoted as an alternative to breast, to breast milk at the time, the instructions were not clear. And many of the mothers did not know how to mix the formula. And they were using water that was not clean, and uh, many of the babies, a number of babies, got sick. And some of them actually died uh, as a result. And it's a horrible case of, of I would say, negligence uh, by Nestle's by not making clear of their, their, their labeling practices. Aesthetics. We talk about aesthetics, how things look, packaging, uh, different styles. And if you will notice, a lot of times these companies will change their packaging. And I'll show you an example here where you have Tropicana. Tropicana changed its packaging. 
Now, this was actually a, a failed attempt. And as I show you this other case, what to learn from Tropicana's packaging redesign failure. So it talked about the actual, the new packaging. And here, here are the issues. That Tropicana invested $35 million in the ad campaign to repackage it. This is the difference. But it turns out that there were a number of challenges that people were more attracted to the Tropicana with the fresh orange on the front than they were with it presented as in a glass. So this is the this is what's stuck out to people in in their minds, the, the fresh orange versus the glass of juice. And again, these are two there are two different perceptions between an orange and a glass of juice. They tried something different with the lid because they wanted to put the orange somewhere on the product and they decided to make a, a cap in the shape of an orange. The logo was changed. Here on the left it is horizontal and on the right it's vertical. It's a very important difference. Then the ads tried to exude a kind of a family drink that when you see when you see pictures of mother and children then you have a sense of warmth but then you also have a sense of safety and security so that kind of translates into this juice being good for your kids being good for your children and something healthy and what went wrong consumers already had an emotional bond with the brand Tropicana said they underestimated the deep emotional bond that consumers had with the original packaging. The, one of the other problems is that the consumers did not quickly recognize the new brand or the new packaging in Tropicana. They, was looking, they were looking for the old, the old cues, um, the fresh orange with the, with the straw sticking out. Uh, they were looking for something very specific. So what are some of the takeaways? Consumers feel an emotional bond with the appearance of the product and the brand they love. Branding elements on a package cannot all be changed at once. Tropicana tried to change many at one time and it certainly um, didn't work. Packaging is the silent salesman. We all know that. And in fact, there are many ways to position products on the shelf. Uh, one time I was in a store in another city and I noticed in the um, place where they sell the candy that the candy bars were, were, were upright as opposed to horizontal. And they were actually, uh, some of them were sticking uh, outward as if to be presented by some Someone is handing you a candy bar. That's the orientation it would be it would be sticking out and I noticed that uh, and it was unique because I had not seen that done before in any other store and I saw that this was a very different way of presenting the the product advertising and packaging design have different communication rules in terms of orientation vertical horizontal and colors and um, you know, but you you can point to a lot of successful repackaging ideas. If I go back to this Google uh, search results, you can see this Heinz tomato ketchup. That was an example of a very successful repackaging effort because what do we do? When ketchup runs low in a bottle, we turn it upside down to get the last bit of it. So Heinz decided, okay, we're going to make a bottle that where you don't have to do that. And it's weighted so that it doesn't tip over and break or, or, or what have you. So lots of, lots of very uh, good examples when we talk about repackaging. Sometimes the size 
is the or the the size of the bottle or the packaging has changed sometimes it's the color sometimes they they give you a different type uh, for example you have a lot of these um, products that are now come in different sizes bite sizes um, different flavors that they combine and you know it it, it presents more options uh, but it also packaging also does something else uh, and give you a personal example when I was uh, a teenager and I would eat every type of candy you can think of I used to like Snickers but then they came out with a bite-sized Snickers years ago and obviously you you look at a Snickers bite size and you just you in two bites you're done but what happens is that you end up because they repackaged it you end up consuming more than you would have before for example if you eat a Snickers bar that's one bar but the fun size or the bite size you may eat three of those or four of those which would be the equivalent of one and a half Snickers if you you know if you if you are like some people binge when they can't stop eating and you look up and you've had three or four portions you know of a snack of cookies or chips or whatever uh, whatever it is that you're eating so yeah there are also lots of methods uh, that are used to to, uh, to increase the sales so what is a brand a brand is as defined in the book as a complex bundle of images and experiences in the customer's mind it performs two functions represents a promise and it is a type of quality certification and I mentioned that in terms of the packaging and you see all of these these um, characteristics of the product on the on the packaging itself um, we we are visual people and there's a psychology of colors if you had me for principles of marketing I may have talked about the psychology of colors and showed you how different colors mean different things and it may not be a surprise to you that many fast food companies use red yellow and orange in their logos because red is a color of excitement and it is said to spur hunger uh, make you hungry and so that is a you know a very interesting connection there when you start talking about uh, packaging and colors and aesthetics and all the things that we saw uh, on previous previous slides but this idea of brand equity how much are we going to put into this product how much are we going to invest into this the marketing of this product because this product from a company standpoint is an asset is part of a portfolio of products so brand equity is an asset that represents the value created by the relationship between the brand and cons customer over time so you put in investments in this product and you want to extract the the value or the customer wants to extract the value out which in turn uh, translates into greater revenue by the uh, by the company so here you have the greater equity benefits you invest in the product hopefully you get greater loyalty less vulnerability to marketing actions by competitors less vulnerability to marketing crisis sometimes when there is a price increase and we have to make decisions sometimes we will stick with what we know because we know the brand and we were willing to pay a little bit more because we have the history of value with that product and we will continue to buy that product regardless of um, the, the price increase well of course it, there's there's elasticity and there, there's a certain point at which you will go before you look for substitutes but typically if the brand is something that you've um, had trust in over a long period of time you you will uh, stick to that what has happened though I mentioned 
this internet commerce era from the late 90s and early 2000s that there was a lot of questions about the idea of branding. And even today, you have the rise of many different companies. This is an article on uh, The Economist magazine, uh, the new titans and how to tame them. So they're talking about Amazon, Facebook, and Google. So these are the big mega brands now. And uh, very interesting that these new age brands are now the, the, the talk of uh, the marketing world. Here you had in Fast Company a cover story of 25 brands that matter now. And uh, in the actual magazine, I'll read some of the the 25 brands that matter now Google Apple Amazon Tesla Netflix Airbnb Facebook Starbucks Instagram NPR Patagonia Warby Parker Nike Spotify Lyft Slack Everlane Sweet Garden so on and so forth. So there are 25 of them. Uh, Adidas is one, HBO, Chobani, the yogurt maker, Twitter, Disney are all there. So uh, very interesting. And then they have uh, some commentary here about each brand and why uh, these brands uh, matter. Some of these brands actually develop into to, to cult icons and People use them for various uh, status reasons to, you know, to show their brand uh, brand loyalty. You have different levels of products. You have local products and brands. For example, when we talk about local products, and we have restaurants that are local. We have, uh, for example, banks that are local. My bank is a regional bank, uh, Capital City. Then you have, right here on Adams Street, you have uh, Olean's Restaurant, which is a local brand that we all we know all too well. You have your domestic uh, products. Your domestic products would be something like uh, Chick-fil-A, which has no international stores. It is totally a domestic brand that is nationwide. They're not open on Sundays. And they have a certain company uh, policy, which is a, which is an a, attractive to a lot of people. It's an attractive brand because it's con it's considered to be more conscientious uh, than the average brand. So that's attractive to to, to many um, consumers. Then you have your international products and brands. Many of these companies, you see this article, old article here. With the logo. Now we all know this logo. We see it on shirts. The Lacoste logo. And back in the day they used to call it the Izod. You had an Izod uh, on your polo shirt. And that was a brand that people recognized. That was quality. And it was um, it, it was kind of uh, synonymous, synonymous with being you know, stylish. And it was that, that was a good thing. You have some other... Uh, brands that um, have had spinoffs or have been customized. Sex in a city in Sex in an African city. This is a a brand we know of Sex in the City, but this has been taken and it's been adapted to suit the uh, the West African market. What other things do I have here? Uh, I have a lot of articles. I'm a clipper. I like clipping articles. I find them to be very useful in case studies that you can use to explain an entire chapter. So um, just bear with me on this. Here you have this. Uh, I talked um, about Nestle's before in the, the baby formula case, but this is a case where they're making inroads in Brazil by using people who cart their products in places that are not that don't have access to the to the um, the stores in the city. These are in kind of the outskirts. So Nestle is um, is one of those brands that is 
gaining a larger footprint because they're using different distribution methods to uh, move the product. So branding strategies. As I go through this last bit here, uh, on page 312, they talk about tiered branding, combination or tiered branding. We all know what tiered branding is. I gave an example in class, and I mentioned the Japanese cars, Honda, Toyota, and Nissan. Now, they have a tiered branding strategy in that they have a luxury model that has its own brand. So for Honda, it's Acura, for Toyota, it's Lexus, and for Nissan, it's the Infiniti. These are separate brands under a parent brand where you have tiered branding, but these represent the, uh, the luxury model of those brands. So brand extension uh, means, uh, means it could mean a number of things. It could mean you're extending your brand into different markets. Uh, you're diversifying your markets, uh, which I think in some ways could, can be a problem if, you, uh, if you're diluting the brand, for example. And uh, if you're talking about getting into areas that where the perception is that you don't have any experience in producing such a product, then it, it can create a, a erosion in, ter in terms of that, uh, that particular brand. But one of the other ways of uh, when, when you talk about brand extension, one example would be, say, Honda. Honda makes cars, and we know they make a good quality car. But then Honda makes also other types of products. They make lawnmowers. They make motorcycles. So they're extending the brand into totally different product categories because a car obviously is in a different category from lawn products, which is in a different category from a motorcycle. Uh, and so you have that example of brand uh, extension. Here are the world's most valuable brands, 2014. I'm not sure how much this list has changed. The last I checked, Apple was still number one, but that was some time ago. I would imagine if you checked now that Amazon probably would be further up the list. I would imagine there would be some variation in the, com the companies that are presented here. One last thing I want to talk about is this idea of country of origin as a brand element. What does it mean country of origin? Well, certain products are branded by country. So for example, here on the slide you have Japan. What products that come from Japan have great notoriety? Certainly their cars, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, cars that I've just mentioned, Mitsubishi, which makes um, also cars, but also makes other types of uh, products. German cars as well. French wine, Italian shoes or clothing uh, are branded. Egyptian cotton is branded. Colombian coffee, uh, Madagascar vanilla. And you may see these actually on the product packaging as offering this value proposition that this is what is equivalent to quality. That if you say Egyptian cotton, if you're in the bedding section of the store and you see Egyptian cotton, you know that that is some of the finest cotton that you can possibly have. So that is a very interesting concept in terms of the, the idea of branding by country.
As COO of Patron Spirits International with 29 years experience in the beverage industry, I've learned that it takes careful analysis and planning to build a global brand. We've used the following steps to expand Patron's reach from three countries to 130 in just six years. To succeed globally, you have to maintain a consistent brand identity, even as you adapt to the values and consumer habits of the target market. So, for example, when we expanded into Japan, we spent a lot of time teaching the country's highly respected bartenders about our manufacturing process and quality ingredients. They then communicated our brand identity to consumers. You'll expand into some countries faster than others, so be aware that you'll have to progress at the right pace for each market. While a developed market like Canada will have clear, consistently applied rules and regulations, evolving economies can leave you subject to ever-changing rules. When going into a country that might represent a challenge, be sure to network with local distributors and thought leaders in your category. These knowledgeable locals can often help you avoid roadblocks. Global brands have to keep track of currency fluctuations, local regulations, and international trade laws that affect their business. It's also important to make sure in-country competitors are following the same rules. In some places, copyright infringement and knockoffs are rampant. By trademarking your product idea, name, and packaging before you even announce your entrance into a new market, you can at least arm yourself to fight violators in court. Finally, as you establish a global brand, look beyond the expected sales channels. One of Patron's most successful channels, and the one that helped us enter the new countries the fastest, is duty-free shops in major airports. Expanding into new countries can be daunting, but you can ease the process by maintaining a consistent brand identity, preparing for varying speeds of entry into different markets, covering yourself legally, and exploring unexpected sales channels.